It's my pleasure in this after lunch session to introduce Carol Dickinson, who is the senior deputy vice chancellor at QUT, is that right? Mm, that one's old. It does not mean old, it means senior gravitas, expertise, leadership. Sure. <laughs> Never call me senior, I think that's the answer for that. Um, who will be uh, introducing the panel that is speaking today after lunch on, uh, what are you speaking on? Juggling life, which will be very interesting. Thank you, Carol. Thank you very much and I hope you did enjoy the lunch. Um, the speakers today are going to be talking on topics which are very critical to student success. And so I'm expecting that we might get some interesting questions at the end of it. We do have three speakers today. The first one is Professor Andrea Durback. Andrea is sitting here uh, in the first seat. Andrea is the Professor of Law and Director of the, Human, the Australian Human Rights Centre at UNSW Sydney. She has held senior positions in the human rights field, including as Deputy Australian Sex Discrimination Commissioner and as a consultant to the Australian Abuse Response Task Force. Between 2015 and 17, though, Andrea led the AHR Centre's major research project, Strengthening Australian Universities' Responses to Sexual Assault and Harassment, which culminated in the publication in August of this year of On Safe Ground, a good practical guide for Australian universities. The second speaker will be Sophie Johnston. Sophie's down at the end there. Sophie is currently the president of the National Union of Students. She, you heard Sophie speak a little bit earlier. She served also as the UNSW Student Representative Council president. Sophie has spent most of her university life working with student organisations to improve quality and accessibility for all students and campaigning for greater funding for education and student income support. The third speaker will be Professor Owen Kalaki. Owen is the Associate Director, Graduate Research and Education and, and Head of the Functional Recovery Research Program at Origin. That's the National Centre of Excellence in Youth Mental Health. He's worked as a clinical psychologist in adolescent and adult public mental health settings and in the private practice. Owen's research is primarily in helping young people with mental illness to recover well. So just to set the scene before these three speakers spend about five to eight minutes talking about different issues around these topics. As we know, the Higher Education Standards Framework includes a section on well-being and safety and requires all providers of higher education institutions to ensure access exists to student support services and to promote and foster a safe environment on campus and online, an increasingly difficult area for us. The prevalence and severity of mental health issues is on the rise in Australia and in higher education institutions, as well as those social, financial, cultural and education issues impacting on our students. Sexual assault and harassment was recently examined in universities, but students from equity groups continue to face structural barriers when seeking to access, participate in, and complete higher education. Support for career planning in the disrupted world of work, something you mentioned earlier today, Sophie, is also important. We also need to enhance the student voice and advocacy in higher education Many institutions in this respect are looking to students as partners in enhancing the quality of the student experience and engagement in higher education. And as Glyn Davis said this morning, we need to engage better with our communities. So these are very big issues for universities to deal with. So let's find out what we need to know about, but what we need to do. Would you welcome our first speaker, Andrea Durback. Thank you very much, Carol, and thank you to TEXA for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here. Um, and I'm, I really welcome the invitation largely because TEXA was one of the um, institutions that we directed our one of our major recommendations coming out of our report to, which I'll speak to later. But I want to start by saying, as many of you will know, um, in August this year, 
the Australian Human Rights Commission released their report on its findings and analysis of the first ever national student survey on sexual assault and harassment in Australian universities. The report changed the course, which was based on, a sur on survey responses from 30,000 students across all 39 universities and qualitative data contained in over 1,800 written submissions to the Commission provided a very significant indication of the nature and extent of university sexual violence. But the report also revealed widespread student dis dissatisfaction with university responses to reports of sexual violence, the adequacy of university support services for students who'd experienced this kind of violence, and the utility of prevention measures. Importantly, it also found that 94% of students who were sexually harassed and 51% of student respondents said they were sexually harassed and 87% of those who were sexually assaulted and that was 7% of, of those who responded did not make a formal complaint to their university. And what was disturbing to us and concerning to us that many of their reasons for not reporting included a fear that they would not be believed by their university a perception that the conduct was not serious enough to warrant making a report, concerns that their reports would not be treated confidentially or that no action would be taken, and additional reasons included a fear of being victimized or discriminated against, particularly by LGBTIQ students, and a confusion about whether the experience was, in the words of one of the students we interviewed, an international student, just part of the Australian culture. Underlying these responses are a number of concerning observations, but I think one stands out, and that is some degree of acceptance or normalization of conduct which is degrading, potentially unlawful, and frequently damaging and enduring in its impact. The National Survey was a key component of a project initiated by my centre, the Australian Human Rights Centre at UNSW, which Carol mentioned, and commissioned by the Hunting Ground Australia project. The major outcome, again as Carol mentioned, of this project was our report on safe ground, a good practice guide for, university, for Australian universities, also released in August this year which combined the Australian Human Rights Commission's analysis of the National Student Survey and comparative international research on university good practice in managing reports of sexual assault and harassment and preventing its occurrence. The project builds on decades of activism by the National Union of Students on the issue of campus sexual violence. And it was largely triggered by the Australian release of the US documentary, The Hunting Ground in 2015, and its resonances for many Australian students, and the opportunity that it presented to bring visibility in Australia to a subject that was frequently met with dismissal, disdain, and denial. The report on safe ground contains 18 recommendations, which as I said, includes one which goes to um, giving greater clarity and clarification to the threshold standards devised by TEXA, which Carol mentioned in relation to the well-being threshold standard, the complaints and grievances threshold standard. I'm delighted to say that TEXA has already acted on that recommendation. It also calls for an establishment of a cross-university task force to implement these recommend 18 recommendations and the recommendations of the Australian Human Rights Commission. It also calls on state and territory legislatures to address this dissonance between um, regulation by universities of some of the university colleges which for, uh, believe they're, no, they, they're not subject to their university regulation, particularly in relation to this issue. And I'm delighted to say that in New South Wales, the relevant minister there has already implemented legislation to bring university colleges under the regulation of universities as a whole, even if they're privately owned, particularly in relation to regulating sexual violence. And finally, just to name a few, it calls for standalone policies on sexual assault and harassment, not to embed this conduct in policies relating, for example, to plagiarism. 
What we make very clear in our report is that re these recommendations will inevitably be shaped by factors relevant to each institution, such, such as size, student demographic, and geographical location, and of course, resources. The recommendations do, however, reflect six foundational principles which we argue should inform Australian good practice, university policies and procedures on sexual violence. And in addition, our report urges that these principles are reinforced by visible university leadership on this issue, comprehensive student engagement, and a sustained commitment to cultural change. And I want to end by just talking a little bit about the call that our report makes for comprehensive student engagement in relation to the management and prevention of sexual violence on university campuses. If we are serious about securing the physical and psychological well-being of students harmed by sexual violence, and I remember Barney Glover, who was at the time the chair of Universities Australia at the launch of the National Student Survey, saying that this harm is enduring and hard to undo. If we are serious about addressing this harm and its enduring impact, our research reveals that we have to ensure that students are at the center of the development, implementation, and revision of policies and strategies that both expose, manage, and reduce university sexual assault and harassment. And we recommend that this involvement and authentic engagement by the student, by the student body be secured via a number of mechanisms. Formalized student representation on committees responsible for formulating and reviewing university sexual assault and harassment policies, formalized representation on university equity and diversity committees, and indeed on university counseling and medical service advisory boards. Importantly, students must be at the center of designing and delivering prevention strategies and the programs and their representation on these committees must include students who can speak to the specific needs of the victims of sexual assault and harassment from the student cohorts most affected by this. And these were identified by the Australian Human Rights Commission as women students, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students, called students, international students, students with disability, and those who identify as LGBTIQ. The inclusion of student representatives on high-level university working groups, on sexual assault and harassment, and on sexual violence prevention committees, as trainers on reporting procedures and prevention strategies, and as speakers in university forums on changing cultural attitudes, will demonstrate a genuine university collaboration with its key stakeholders. And it will also recognize the primacy of student leadership in developing solutions that speak to the student body, body. The reason we called our report on safe ground was it was a call in a sense for, for resolution of this issue or solutions to this issue to come from the ground up, not to be imposed from above. It, these are the people, the students are the people who are a, best able to guide universities towards a more practice, proactive and coherent rather than reactionary and piecemeal approach to addressing and preventing, preventing sexual violence. And I have to say that as the issue of sexual violence gains more and more prominence across, across many professions and sectors across the world, it is within the educational sector that we have a huge role to play. As my Vice Chancellor Ian Jacobs said at the launch of the survey, if we can help bring about a cultural shift among our 1.3 million students, there will be enormous benefits for Australian society as a whole as they go through their lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sophie, would you like to go next? Yeah, um, thank you. I'd like to thank Texa for inviting me along to speak. Um, I don't usually have a laptop in front of me but had some te technical difficulties, so I apologise for that. Um, I also want to recognise all of the students here. It's fantastic to see so many, and I want to thank Texa um, for their encouragement um, in getting so many students along. It's really, really good to see them, you know, in this kind of forum. 
Um, it really, really is a fascinating time um, for the higher education sector and for the next generation of graduates. We're entering into a new industrial revolution, like I spoke about earlier, the automation and artificial intelligence changing um, the way that we work. We've seen a rise in startup enterprises that are, are largely founded by graduates. Students are developing skills in, um, that will be essential to adapting to these new jobs and these new industries. And potentially one of the most significant changes is going to be uh, that more than half of this generation will have some form um, of post-graduate, uh, uh, post-high school um, education um, as the latest uh, census data found. The student experience is definitely changing and in uh, many ways we tend to simplify what it is to be a student, you know, that we go to class, we go home and, th and that's it. Students are juggling part-time work and full-time study and at the same time they're applying for internships, exchanges and scholarships that are all necessary today in gaining employment um, after graduation. Universities really need to be doing more to ensure that um, students can not only gain access to these um, development opportunities, but they're also um, w well paid and, and, and students aren't just participating in unpaid internships um, that lock a lot of people out. In 2012, Universities Australia ran its student finance survey in collaboration with NUS that found more than 66% of students were worried about their financial situation. It found 25% of employed students work more than 20 hours per week and one third of those uh, said they regularly miss class for work commitments. The situation more than five years late, um, th this situation was more than five years ago and we ran the survey again this year. The report will be coming out next year and we expect it to be much, much worse. We can't pretend that issues around housing, wages and jobs aren't problems that dramatically affect today's students. It's no surprise that attrition rates among first year students were uh, significantly worse across universities. And universities should be doing a lot more to provide that uh, support for commencing students. There's un undoubtedly an increase in prevalence of mental health among young, pe young people, particularly students, which again is sadly unsurprising. Having to juggle heavy workloads, pressures in gaining industry experience, navigating a tenuous income support system and coping with a rising cost of living um, does sometimes make it impossible to cope. We have a responsibility to ensure our students are afforded with the right platform to succeed. We know that mental health is more prevalent and with the increasing pressures of being a student in 2017, we should prioritise creating resilient graduates. Well-being and resilience should be ingrained in all aspects of student life, our learning and our classroom environments. We need to recognise the investment in counselling and psychological services that enable students to contribute wholly to our studies. This investment will undoubtedly uh, improve retention, produce a high quality cohort of diverse graduates and bolster our success rates. It has never been a more important time for us to be providing a flexible uh, higher education, but that should never be to the detriment of high quality learning. This challenge should not be underestimated. While we move into a highly digital age, the benefits of online lear learning opportunities in creating flexibility, accessibility and global networks is very clear. But we also need to recognise the dynamic community environment created by face-to-face -face learning and the overwhelming benefits both to student and teacher in developing this supportive and valuable learning experience. As students, we recognise the value in global educational experiences that develop us as thought leaders and world changers. Whether it's through exchange opportunities, global internships, online networking or idea sh sharing with uh, students across the world. The tertiary sector is the beating heart of a society. We're developing the next thought leaders, innovators, and most importantly, a socially responsible generation. We need to work together with our students, um, and we'll talk about students as partners this week, to ensure they feel invested in the experience they have at university. Students should be incorporated into the aspects of decision making. Um, it shouldn't just be a, a last minute consultation. Um, they should be at, heart, at the heart of everything that we do as higher education providers and be involved um, in the decisions that impact our future. Thank you. And Owen. Thanks. And um, I'd also like to thank uh, Texa for, for inviting me to be here. And I, I was going to start by just jokingly saying what they said would be sufficient. Um, but listening to you, you've kind of, you know, uh, covered a lot of the things that I wanted to say. 
The um, origin is a, 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 the National Centre of Excellence in Youth Mental Health, and, and our interest in, in student health is obviously because we look at, at young people aged under 25. And the thing about that age group is that 75% of the onset of mental illness, so 75% of anybody who's ever going to get a mental illness has had their first experience of it um, by the time that they're 25. And, and the key period for that is late adolescence and, and into the early 20s. And then not surprisingly, of course, this is an age when people are moving from um, their secondary education into their post-secondary education, but also doing a number of other really important life tasks. So individuating from their family of origin, determining who they are, beginning to have relationships. Um, and the onset of mental illness in that, at, that, at that time in life has the capacity to um, derail that process and have, it, have people end up um, not making those transitions. And the, the disability that accrues from that then can be very long lasting. We know from our studies that people who fall out of um, education, who don't make the transition into the workforce, quite often tend to not make that um, step back if they have a, an illness. If you look at the disability support pension um, currently, 50% of the people who are on the disability support pension aged under 35 have um, mental illness as their primary disability. And the sad thing about that is, um, well, there's two terrible sad things about that. The first, the first is that the two key exits off the disability support pension um, are death and the old age pension. Now, it's a terrible thing if we have a young person who encounters a mental health problem in their late teens or early 20s, uh, and that becomes their future. The thing that makes that an absolute tragedy, though, is that the number one thing people with mental health issues want to do is actually not address their health. It's to complete their education and enter the workforce. So we have these two things which are, are driving in very separate directions. I think some of the causes of the mental health problems amongst students have been um, articulated quite well, but probably worth saying again. So uh, people who've moved away from home, um, people, I, I think the other group of people who we see an awful lot in our clinical services are um, international students who've not only moved away from home, but are away from sources of support and, and often in a very different culture um, from the culture from which they've come. Um, the, the barriers, I think, to, to, for people getting um, the appropriate help they need. Uh, some of them are structural. I think in many of the places that, that we um, work in, we don't have the, the pathways for people to seek the care within that. And I think one of the things that you said, um, Sophie, was really right, that universities where people come, or uh, other educational institutions where people are, need to be communities where people feel connected to it. And I think if people don't have a pathway to connect to help through that, if that's their prime um, identity at that time in life, is a real problem. The other big problem, I think, that, that uh, needs to be addressed is, is the stigma around mental illness as well. And I think even though we've come a long way around some things like anxiety and depression, there's still an awful long way to go in beginning to um, address that. And, and one of the things we know from studies we've done and studies other people have done is that the perceived stigma, the, st the stigma that people perceive they'll experience if they report their, their mental health um, stops them seeking help, which is, which is a tragedy, um, but it also stops them wanting to engage in, in their education in the first place. We know that 64% of people with mental health issues avoid um, applying for courses because they perceive they'll be stigmatised um, because of their, their health issues. So what can, we, what can we do about all of this? Well, I think that there's a a number of things from a mental health perspective. It would be great if the sector um, collaborated more because the other, sorry, the last group of people I want to speak to are the, the, the students who do their stuff uh, remotely or online now, who are, are often quite isolated from any of the sort of su support that we have. And even if there are good supports in a particular institution, if they're hundreds of, or thousands of kilometres away, they can't access those. So, we need to network across the whole sector so that if somebody's studying a course through Melbourne Uni but they're living somewhere else, that if they need help, there's a way for them through Melbourne Uni to be able to identify where the help local to them uh, is. Um, and one of, one of the things that I've, I've thought for a while is I find it strange. I mean, we do a lot of work with um, Headspace, which is a, a primary mental health care for um, people aged 12 to 25 around the country. And I've often found it strange that as you go around universities and, and other educational facilities, 
that there, there doesn't seem to be, I might be wrong, but it doesn't seem that any of the 110 headspaces are located around those places or in situations where there is a number of universities close together where there'd be a huge population that could access that um, and access a, a much broader range of supports than perhaps individual institutions could provide. Um, so I might, I might stop at that point. Okay, thank you very much um, to all of our three speakers. Well, as I said at the beginning, these are not easy topics. They're um, sometimes difficult to talk about and they're certainly uh, difficult for us all to deal with. And it does seem like that there's even possibly a fair amount of education that might be required. And in fact, looking at the top question there, um, would the panel agree that education on what is and what is not sexual harassment is needed for men and women? The definition of these sexual harassments is so undefined uh, that being looked at could count. It's not, this is not sexual assault, I think that means. This is part of why they are not reported and they fear they will not be believed. What do you think about that? Um, Sophie, do you think that there's education required even for students, you know, about what those things are or doesn't it matter? If it's happening, it's happening. Yeah, um, I, I, I think there's a serious lack of education. Um, it's not just um, once you get to university, there's a serious lack of sex education right from the beginning in primary school and high school. Um, so I think that it really, really needs to start there. Um, part of the, the problem, the reason that, you know, it's not something that's talked about, it's not something that's really been um, largely reported on um, and universities don't really have these reporting structures is because it's been so undefined, um, so, you know, such an unspoken issue for so long. Uh, the report that came out this year, um, I think one of the most important things that it did was really start the conversation and it has taken decades and decades for that conversation to be started, um, but at least now we, we do need to, um, you know, have our universities define exactly what, you know, sexual harassment, sexual assault is, define exactly what their um, responses are to it, what the um, consequences are for perpetrators, um, and then I think, you know, that's going to be a good step in really combating that culture. Thank you. Andrea, what about from your point of view, from what you've seen, is there education required in the community? I think definitely, and um, just to reinforce what Sophie said, part of the problem is for many students, particularly those who are coming from backgrounds where they're not exposed to um, the university environment, they're not exposed also to alcohol or to sort of cultural events that um, or many of these students are trying to actually ingratiate themselves in the student community, and I don't use that word um, pejoratively, but it's, it's trying to be accepted for many of these students, and so they, they assume that certain conduct is okay or so I think the definition, the start to start with definitions, definitions aren't everything. And as a lawyer, um, I've, I feel very strongly about that. Definitions aren't everything. The culture in which people um, live their lives or are educated is fundamentally important. And that means leadership is crucial in setting what are the parameters of acceptable behavior. Definitions take you so far that you can have the best definitions in the world, but if you have a culture that enables conduct, that is unacceptable um, and, de and um, degrades people based on their gender or ethnicity or whatever, then the definition goes nowhere. So it's a combination of leadership, definition. I think people do are crying out for a sense of what is prescribed um, conduct. And that's why we say you have to have, and I'm very pleased the questions is raised, you have to have standalone sexual assault and harassment policies for starters so that it's not embedded in other policies and get sort of confused about what, what is misconduct, what is sexual misconduct. It doesn't say anything. Um, so I think, yes, definitions in short is a, is a good starting point. And oh, and you could almost say the same for mental health. So universities are yeah. often feel a bit ill-prepared yeah. and in fact, we may try and deal with it with mis misconduct policies, which is not really appropriate. What advice would you provide to universities about, you know, better education in, in their area? We'd agree around the, the policy issue that it needs to be a separate um, For mental health. policy around mental health as well. Um, in part so it doesn't become hidden um, under, you know, a, a more broader health or a more broader um, kind of well-being. And I think, I think the thing about mental health is we, we should actually call it for what it is. And one of the things that uh, I worry sometimes is does it, 
I, I, you know, in some of my work in, in the more corporate settings, that the word, you know, words like well-being um, get used. Uh, and it's, it's good, we should aim for well-being, that's good, but we shouldn't be afraid to talk about the fact that there are mental health problems and we need to name them and have policies separately for them. But then I think, like that around mental health, that we also need education for um, people so they've got a basic level of literacy so they can recognise when they might have a, a problem or somebody else has a problem, but also for staff to be able to respond well to that as well. Can I just add, Carol, yeah. sorry, but just Sophie mentioning online education. Mm. Online sexual abuse mm. is a whole other area. Mm. So when you talk about definition, um, do you include that? Because we're seeing an absolute increase across the student body of online, or tech, as it's called, technology facilitated sexual violence. And the difficulty with it is because the physical dimension of the conduct isn't there, um, people think, oh, well, it's not that big a deal. But in fact, and I'm sure you know this from your work, Owen, that the, in, the impact of online sexual violence and abuse is very, very dramatic and significant. Mm -hmm. Because you sometimes don't know how to locate where it's coming from, how to get a sanction, how to stop it. So it's very intrusive and very frightening for many students. So how can universities provide support for online students from either mental health or sexual uh, harassment or, or assault? That's very difficult. Very, very difficult. Any advice you can provide? <laughs> oh, no. Well, um, no, I, I, I think it is, it is a, a very difficult issue and I think it's one that hasn't really been grappled with su um, sufficiently to come up with, with good answers yet. And, uh, you know, it, it, I, I think it is actually one of those things, and I, I, I think that's what I was trying to say before, that uh, isn't going to be addressed by in individual institutions alone, because the, the distance is um, the common element, but, but the response needs to be across all of that. Sophie, the second question there, how can students take a more active role on regulation and quality assurance to ensure student wellbeing sits alongside more standard outcome metrics? So how can we make it genuine? You said it's got to be real. So how can we do that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> where, where do I start with this? Um, I think uh, TEXA has taken some really great steps in terms of um, this year we, um, the National Union of Students, um, CAFA and, and CESA, the international student body, um, have all entered into a memorandum of understanding with TEXA. Um, we've been engaged in um, organising the conference. I, I think the challenging part is um, on a university or a provider level um, in actually forging that trust relationship, and I think it is about trust. Um, you know, at the moment, student leaders really do feel that they um, are the kind of last person to be consulted um, in, in the decision-making process of the university. Uh, overseas, um, in the UK, um, even in New Zealand, what they're um, starting to develop is real student partnerships, so students being um, at the forefront of the decision making from the get go, and that's in every level um, of university decision making, from uh, course construction to um, you know some of the big deci bigger decisions about you know what kind of facilities are um, at the university, what kind of um, student experience do does the university um, or the provider want to create. Um, I think there really needs to be a leap by universities to trust their student representatives, trust their student bodies, um, you know, to engage um, them in this process. Things like, um, we, we have academic board reps at the moment, but the problem is the lack of training that they're actually provided um, when they're going into meetings. So um, it, it does create a barrier where they can't really wholly engage in the discussions that's going on. So I think training is essential for student representatives. I think um, making sure that they're in the decision-making process um, from the get-go and, and really, really building that um, trust relationship and showing that it's not just a consultation, tick the box um, kind of a um, process. And do you see any university doing this or attempting to do this? Um, there's definitely a, um, a d desire and, and more talk, especially this year. Sally Varnum, um, who's here, who's going to be running a, a, a session on student partnerships, so you'll hear a bit more about it then. But universities are, are definitely interested in, in getting to this point where they have, you know, student partnerships and that sort of thing. But I still do believe there's, there's a way, a way to, go. to go. Andrea, there's a couple of questions on there about the survey. 
Yes. So, for example, um, is it fair to say that sexual harassment reported um, on journeys to and from universities uh, unfairly then laid blame at the university door? And then what, what would be a successful follow-up survey to the one that's already been conducted? So if we, maybe if we take those two together. Um, yes, I actually agree with that question. Um, if we'd had probably more to do with the design of the survey, um, we, we might have altered some of the questions not to come up with, um, I think that was quite a, a sort of unfortunate um, of a finding, but it was nonetheless true. That's what students reported. Um, I think what's probably more interesting to say, it's not about laying blame at the universities for, for, the, for the conduct. I think where the blame with, with our institutions is the inept responses or the incompetent responses um, to the reporting when it is reported. That's the failure. That's the institutional failure. It's, it's not so much the nature of the conduct. Um, so it's the, the blame that we're sort of saying sits with universities is how they respond and how they prevent um, sexual violence. Because it's a given, it happens, we know anecdotally. But I think importantly linked to that observation or finding is that many students, as I said before, don't report. They don't report for a number of reasons. Um, international students say they don't report because they're terrified about visa implications. They don't report because of, of issues around honor for many of them who come from families where this sort of conduct or what happened to them. Um, in the case of the young woman we interviewed who'd fallen pregnant from a rape, um, you know, she was going to be the breadwinner for her family. Her family totally ostracized her uh, because she came from a a community that was absolutely, uh, absolutely abhorred um, that she got herself in this situation. So um, getting to the, the other question, which is now I can't see the follow-up follow survey. Look, I think um, the, the, um, the way, getting back to the question about definitions, I think the way the conduct was detailed in the survey probably could be improved. I also think the way it's designed needs to go to Sophie and my earlier point, needs students to be part of the design of the survey. They were the missing voice from my view. Um, even though the NUS, we, we brought them on board initially to design it with us, by the time it got to its final, the final product of the survey, the student voice had, had, had largely been um, ignored, quite frankly, and I think students have to design it they understand what is happening to them and their colleagues better than any of us. So they need to design it and they also need to be part of the implementation of the survey. Rather than an institution or an organization, the NUS needs to be, or, or similar bodies, need to be really making sure that this gets out to all the relevant student cohorts and that there's a really good response. So I think in terms of design and implementation, students are key to the next follow-up survey and the definitions need to be improved. It's a bit of a constant theme there, isn't it? There is a question here, you talked about um, students maybe being embarrassed to come forward about sexual harassment or sexual assault. That may also be the case, as that question says there, about mental health. Uh, they may be afraid of getting help in the university, even though there are some services that might be there to help them. So how do universities reach them? And I guess, Owen and Sophie, you might have views about that. How do we make them feel okay to come forward and seek that help? Um, I think a, a lot of that is about, you know, we talk about um, having, you know, well-being and resilience as part of the university experience. So I think breaking down the stigma is universities, I, I see there's something here about um, incorporating core units around health awareness. And I think that's something that universities can be doing, having wellness and resilience embedded um, in the course programs. Universities already um, hold uh, days around um, mental health awareness. And I think that that's um, really picked up in the last few years and I think that's a really, really good direction um, for us to be going in, in terms of breaking down those stigmas, saying it's okay to um, speak out, here are the services, um, you know, if you need them. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, think, um, I, think, I think there's a few things. So it's great if there are services, but we need to make sure there's sufficient services. Um, one of the things I think uh, a lot of people find very frustrating is when they've identified that they need help, 
um, and then they go to access it, but there's you know, a long waiting list or something else. So if there's not sufficient services within uh, the, the, the institution, there needs to be networks to this, the services that are available in the community around that as well, so that people can be linked in um, kind of quickly. And I think, I think, I think the, the other thing that we should be mindful of is, um, I, I think all of the stuff to raise awareness is great, but if we raise awareness and don't at the same time build up the services, it's almost kind of um, insulting to people because you're telling people, you know, to better ways to identify that they have a problem, but then giving them no means to do something about that problem. So I think awareness what raising by itself is not sufficient, it has to go hand in hand with creating the support services for people um, to be able to access. And there's a question here. I mean, students may not arrive at university with these problems. They may come from where they've come from. So the question there about, do you know of any examples where tertiary bodies work closely with high schools to address these issues is relevant? You don't know of anyone? In relation to sexual violence, yep. yes, there's um, an organisation called Fair Agenda, which, mm. do, which has done some great work with um, high schools on this issue. So um, it's definitely, that's a, it's a, it's a common call that um, we get students who already come with um, views or assumptions or stereotypes. Um, so it's important to address it before, before they get going. absolutely crucial. And Carol, I wonder if I could just add to Owen's point about the sufficiency of resources. I think what came out of our work, um, and a lot of it is about mental health that mm. comes from the anxiety and depression that comes from uh, um, sexual harassment and assault from these students, is that you, it's not just about sufficient resources, which is crucial, but actually having specialised personnel that are able to deal with these particular um, issues of students. And I think just to sort of lump them in a student health service that doesn't have anyone in the student health service that can deal with trauma, the trauma related to sexual violence, is negligent, as you yeah. were saying. I think it really is. Um, because you build up that we offer these services that you don't provide. Um, so even um, ANU have done a marvelous thing where they've linked with an external, there's a formalized link with an external specialized service mm -hmm. that students can have access to, even though it's not in-house. Mm -hmm. Which may sometimes be easier for the students Precisely. as well. Sophie, there's a question there for you, the second one from the top there. As universities rapidly add bodies to courses, do you have any input into what courses to run so that students get jobs on graduation? Would you do this? Will I do this? Um, <laughs> would you take over the university? <laughs> <laughs> you could. Um, I'm assuming that this means what kind of things can be added to the courses to enable students, students to get to jobs. Get, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that there is a rise in, um, in importance in having um, interdisciplin uh, interdisciplinary learning um, as uh, part of um, the university and tertiary experience. So um, giving students the ability to you know, uh, build skills in communication, um, in leadership, in adaptability, um, being able to be thought leaders and innovative in the way that they think is going to be really, really important um, for the new job market. We don't know what jobs are going to um, exist in the next 10 to 15 years, but what we do know is that we need our graduates to be able to think creatively, um, be adaptable, um, have good communication skills um, with the rise of um, artificial intelligence and these types of things. So I think, you know, while core subjects in, um, you know, engineering, law, um, you know, medicine are, are going to be really, really important. Also incorporating those social communicative um, leadership skills um, into the way that we're teaching our graduates. So teach, and, and also assessment, I think you're saying as well, we could do better there, perhaps? In, in assessment. In assessment, make it more realistic too. Yeah, absolutely, and, and definitely um, engage more w with industries in, in yeah. developing those students, whether it's, um, you know, students, uh, like I said earlier, in the UK, um, they have um, both industry, you, you can, you know, have experience yeah. in industry while you're um, completing a degree, things like that, that we don't, we haven't really started to do here yet, but I think we'll, you know, start, start to happen, yeah. Um, Owen, there's a question there for you about whether you can work with universities to facilitate completion of degrees for students with mental health problems. 
they end up with no qualifications and a hex debt. Um, yep, definitely. Um, not personally, but um, uh, the, the research that we've done over the last 10 years has looked at um, how we better support young people with mental ill health um, to complete their education and, and, to, and to get into the workforce. Um, and, and a lot of what we would be recommending out of that, and we've definitely recommended it to government, is, is just about um, having specific people in institutions uh, who are, who are um, well, well informed on the various challenges people with mental ill health face um, and who will work with the people to, to actually overcome those challenges. And, you know, if you're thinking about it in a workplace context, this, this is really just about making accommodations in a, in a workplace for a lot of people. Um, you know, traditionally, you might think about, you know, more exam time or something, but maybe it, it, there's some other things, because often the things that are affected for people are things like concentration um, and memory. Uh, if people are on medication, perhaps they're, you know, they're drowsy at different times of the day. So figuring out what it is for each individual and coming up with those accommodations. And, and quite often what we found in our research is that people's drive to complete their, you know, in this case, education, with that little bit of support is, is enough to actually help them to, to, do, to do that. Okay, thank you. Strikes me we make a lot of accommodation for elite athletes. Yes. Um, perhaps we should be doing the same here. Um, Work-life balance is a challenge. What can you, how can universities better prepare both staff and students for this? Any, any views here? Any advice? Ah, it's a tough one because it's, it's not just, I, I think that part of the problem is that a lot of students or, or more and more students are having to um, drop down to part-time study because they, you know, need to work to support themselves and I think that's a bigger um, cultural problem really than that universities can probably deal with on their own. Um, I think that universities can um, provide support um, to students, you know, where they can, you know, go to apply for income support, what kind of scholarships they can um, apply for if they are in trouble and really um, build, uh, building up that support from the get-go from, you know, a first-year student right throughout. Um, another thing that some universities do really well is ensuring that, um, you know, the, the shops and things that they have on campus, the jobs actually go to people who study there or they prioritise um, providing those jobs to people who study there so that, you know, you study on campus, you're working on campus, um, it, it makes it a lot more easy to facilitate a really, really um, heavy schedule. There's a couple more questions there for you, Sophie, have you noticed? Oh, no. <laughs> it's a lot more difficult for students to have a voice in larger institutions. It's probably hard for staff too, probably. Um, they feel just like a number rather than an individual. Are there any suggestions for encouraging students to be proactive at their institution and more importantly, to allow them to feel comfortable and able mm. to do so? What have uh, you seen that might work? Yeah, I, I think that the, that the part about feeling comfortable is really important. It, it takes, um, it's important for the institutions to be building up that confidence and part of that is, you know, having a really, really good um, community um, student life, you know, from the get-go, from as soon as you walk onto O Week, there's um, people everywhere, there's communities and societies and things like that that you can join and, and be a part of. Um, I mean, personally, my, my experience was um, joining a society during O Week and slowly building the confidence to eventually, you know, get involved in the student union and those types of things. So I think um, really making sure that the university is not just focusing on the academic side um, of a university experience, but focusing on that community um, development um, of, the, of the individual. Okay, well, we've just about run out of time, um, as it would seem, but I think there's been a, a range, these are really important topics, as I said, quite difficult, complex. Students have very complex lives, and it is also complex for universities and other institutions, and we have a lot of different institutions in the room today to manage that. Clearly some good questions here from our students, so thank you very much for asking those questions. Um, but if you'd please thank the panel for today's contribution. And thank you to Carol too, thank you Carol. <clears throat>